Welcome back, everybody. This is our Art History Survey 1 Unit 4 review. Review for the last unit test. This is the art of the Middle Ages, obviously. We're now looking at the first work that we needed to know for identification or other purposes. This is from the medieval Anglo-Saxon period. So remember that after the fall of the Roman Empire, the Germanic tribes have been a problem for the empire um, for several years uh, prior to the sacking of Rome. And so the territory that we think of as Western Europe has long been occupied by people essentially of Germanic uh, descent. There are also, of course, incursions into the British Isles from people from uh, Denmark and other locations, the Angles and the Saxons, and that's where we get this Anglo-Saxon term from. So the Anglo-Saxon era uh, is typified by this type of tracery work, the interlacing, knotting design that we sometimes think of as Celtic knotting. We certainly see a big uh, use of symmetry in these designs and very abstracted humanoid and animal shapes. This object is the Sutton Hoo purse cover. It was discovered in a uh, ship burial in Suffolk, England, and we know that an uh, important person, probably a king, uh, was buried within this ship. There is a very famous helmet that was found near his head, as well as other objects uh, that, in, for the most part, are decorated in this really uh, intricate way, often uh, using the technique of cloisonne. Cloisonne, of course, is an enameling technique that provides this beautiful color in between these raised areas of gold. The cloisonne is done here. This is a more contemporary example, but you can see that the objects that are being made have areas that are raised up. So the metal walls, if you will, act like little wells that the liquid enamel can be painted into, and then it is hardened in the kiln. We also talked about the importance early on in uh, history of the way that books were created. So an illustrated book we refer to as an illuminated manuscript, and these were made by hand. The printing press had not been invented yet. Uh, they were made primarily by monks and nuns who were working in specialized uh, studios or rooms where this uh, copying of manuscripts would take place by hand. So a singular uh, scriptorium, or the plural scriptoria, these were found in monasteries and abbeys, and the monks did this type of copying partially as an act of devotion, as an act of prayer, um, obviously in order to create multiple copies of text to distribute them. But the majority of people in the Middle Ages couldn't read. The people that were able to read primarily were involved in the service of the church. So some of the uh, texts themselves have somewhat coded messages in them that you would have to be a member of the faith really to understand. The illuminated manuscript specifically refers to the illustrations, and so some members of the monks would uh, embellish the copies that they were making with, at the very least, elaborate decorations in the initials of the first letter of the first word on each page, but also in section breaks and illustrations within the text as well. The books are made essentially of uh, calfskin that's been specially treated, and each page is known as a folio. The front of the folio is called the recto, and the verso is the back side. So have a book laid open like in this example.
read or to say at specific times of day or times of the year. And then the Passionals were also um, more widely distributed. They were compilations of the lives of saints. So here's an example of a folio. This is the verso side of folio 26 from the Lindisfarne Gospels. Now, Lindisfarne is an island off the coast of Scotland, and it is, in fact, founded originally by monks who were Christian monks who had begun their, um, founded their orders in Ireland. And so they first moved to Iona and then to Lindisfarne and then facing multiple incursions from the Vikings. In fact, a lot of monks moved from Lindisfarne to other points within uh, what is now the United Kingdom. So we can think of this as now Hiberno-Saxon style. Hibernia was the name that the Romans used for uh, for Ireland. The uh, the idea here of this new style, though, can also be referred to as insular style, uh, insula being the term for an island. So the Hiberno-Saxon implies this uh, style coming to us really from Ireland into Scotland and then throughout the rest of uh, Great Britain. The image that you're looking at here obviously shows a cross and it has multiple circles and other intricate details within it, but the uh, page itself is not a letter. It's not part of the text. This actually is a page, or rather a section break, which we refer to often as a carpet page, not only because of its function as a border, but because it fills the entire uh, format of the page with this carpet-like elaborate interlocking tracery. This is a page from the Book of Kells. So this is another Hiberno-Saxon uh, illuminated manuscript. It is an important section because it does in fact contain letters and at first glance you may not read them as such but there's what looks like a uh, contemporary letter X, a letter P, and a letter I which actually are the Greek alphabet letters that start the initials of Christ or start the, the sound uh, the, uh, sounds that would be the first word of this section of the gospel. So what you're seeing, in fact, is, again, intricate interlacing. There are also hidden images. There's uh, cats and mice here fighting over the host. We have a human head here. There's angels in this section, even images of moths. So there's all kinds of hidden images within. And again, the letters themselves that form the beginning of the word Christ, in fact, are somewhat hidden within the pattern as well. So again, this is not a book that if you were just someone literate and picked it up, you would automatically be able to read. It is somewhat of a coded message. Also from the Hiberno-Saxon era, we have these elaborate high crosses. They are uh, essentially sculptures, and they are used primarily to denote religious spaces, to kind of announce that this territory belongs to a church or to an abbey. This is the high cross of Mariada in <clears throat> in Monstervos in England, in Ireland. And the image that you see on it on the front is the Christ figure. Here we're looking at the crucified Christ. On the opposite side, you see Christ in judgment in the second coming. So you can see that the object itself is pretty thick. It's not a thin, uh, thin cross. It's almost um, the same dimensions on the sides. Uh, so it really does have an elaborate degree of carving and uh, repeated pattern, but also the imagery is very much heavily symbolic, much like the images in the uh, Illuminated Manuscript books. We want to make sure that what we're looking at here is readable to people, the image being recognizable, uh, so that the story of the Bible can be told. As we move into the uh, solidification of those Germanic tribes, one uh, family, if you will, one tribal group, the Franks, begin to gain control over the uh, mainland of Western Europe. Uh, this Germanic tribe, the Franks, 
solidify their power under the King Charles, or sometimes known, of course, as Charlemagne. And this is where we get the name of the Carolingian Empire. Charlemagne, in fact, allies himself with the Pope, who's, of course, still active in Rome and controls essentially the papal states. Uh, but we have now this alliance between a secular and a religious leader, and the Pope, in fact, crowns Charlemagne as the first ever Holy Roman Emperor in the year 800. And so he is in this piece really kind of um, relying on our knowledge of the art uh, styles and even poses dating all the way back to the time of Constantine. So he is presenting him as the heir to the Roman Empire during a period, of course, that it was Christian and under the control of a single ruler. The obvious visual reference is the equestrian statue of Marcus Aurelius, but it also feels somewhat like the colossal statue of Constantine in terms of the simplicity of the figure. We also see, of course, that the figure is at a larger scale than the horse itself. The figure is overall at a relatively small scale. This is far smaller than life size. So it is cast bronze, but we have lost the skill of bronze casting at an enormous uh, scale. This is either Charlemagne or his successor, Charles the Bald, but definitely one of the Carolingian emperors. During the Carolingian era, the uh, tradition of illuminated manuscripts, of course, continues, but the emphasis is now on trying to intentionally revive the styles of the uh, Roman Empire. So there's a bit of an Eastern influence here, but definitely a Constantinian influence as well. And you're seeing that the figure, although the proportions are not perfect, the drapery does seem to suggest the body underneath. Um, it will become more and more elaborate and more and more decorative as we go forward. But you can see that the artist who created this uh, section break, the beginning of the Book of Math in the, what is known as the Coronation Gospels. These were, uh, this was a, a gospel book that was commissioned by Charlemagne. And in fact, he was buried with it, legend has it. And the uh, successors to the Carolingian Empire, the Ottonian emperors, in fact, discovered the book there and took it back out of the tomb is the legend. So this is a great example of that Roman influence all throughout the Holy Roman Empire and how important that was for the Carolingians. So speaking of the Ottonians, after about the year 880, roughly, the Carolingian uh, Empire, the power of the line of Charlemagne begins to dissipate, and it takes a little while for a new unification to occur. Roughly around the year 920 or so, we have the first uh, of the emperors named Otto. So Otto I is the person for whom we name the Atonian era, uh, and the Atonian era lasts until about the year 1020. So we have another hundred years or so of the Atonians ruling the Holy Roman Empire. So both the Carolingian and the Atonian technically are part of the Holy Roman Empire, of course, but those two specific eras we separate out. The Carolingian being the, the first under Charlemagne, Ottonian beginning with the reign of Otto I. What you're looking at here is St. Michael's in Hildesheim in Germany. It is a newly constructed church in Ottonian times, and Bishop Bernward is responsible for having this new church built, and it is very much based on the uh, Romanesque basilica design and the Christian uh, churches of the end of the Roman Empire, but you can see that some changes have made. We've gone a little bit back to the Roman Basilica idea of the entrances being on the long sides with two apses on either side, left and right. So this is St. Michael's uh, in Hildesheim. The uh, church itself is a little bit unusual in its architecture as well in that it has an enormous number of towers. There's actually six towers. And we also have essentially two transepts, basically two crossing aisles before the apses on either end. There's also, of course, the very famous cast bronze doors that Bernward requested for this building. They, in fact, have been moved 
to another church in Hildesheim, and scholars are debating about whether they were moved there or whether they were originally for this other church, but there is dispute about whether Bernard Bernard actually was the uh, bishop who commissioned the second church anyway. So we know he's responsible for both this church and these doors. So your textbook and I really believe that these doors originally were for this particular church in Hildesheim. Another Atonian object important to us from the end of the Atonian era is the lectionary of Henry II. He was the last of the Atonian emperors. He also commissioned this text for a church. And so he uh, requested it and, and supplied the patronage for it, but it is a lectionary. And of course, a lectionary is selections from the Gospels in the order that they will be read by the priests throughout the year during Masses. And so this would have been used in the church. And clearly you can see by now, not only the influence from Rome, but the true eastern half of the Roman Empire, the Byzantine style, you can see that it looks a lot like the paintings and uh, mix that we saw in Unit 3. The gold leaf background in particular is very uh, predominant there, but it does also recall some of the work that we saw, like the apse mosaic with the sheep, where the figures of the sheep were identical, kind of repeated silhouettes. You see that in the hill, in the sheep as well, and even in the faces of the shepherds, they pretty much the same face again and again and again. This is the Annunciation to the Shepherds, so it's the announcement of the birth of Christ. So Mary has given birth to Jesus and the announcing angel is here telling the shepherds to travel to see him. This brings us now to France, to the true beginnings of the Romanesque era. And we call this era and style Romanesque because it so much recalls the art of Rome and specifically these of rounded arches, in the architecture. This is a reliquary. It is an object designed to house the relics of a saint. And it itself would be an object of veneration by pilgrims who would come from church to church along pilgrimage routes specifically to see these relics and of course to do their Christian duty, which would be to make at least one pilgrimage through Europe um, and preferably if you could afford it, a second pilgrimage uh, all the way to the Holy Land. So the pilgrimage routes through uh, France and into Spain would end at Compostela in Spain. And then from there, you could take a trip to Jerusalem. So this particular saint is Saint Foi or Saint Faith. She was a young girl martyred, and her skull is actually inside of this object. It is a wooden core that has been covered, obviously, in gold and silver gilt. Part of the uh, work here has been repurposed from a Roman soldier's parade helmet. And so it is an object that comes from multiple different sources. It definitely has an enormous amount of encrusted jewels on the surface. And so it's somewhat similar to the types of covers that we saw for gospel books as well. So again, reliquaries are essentially sculptural containers that hold the relics of the saints. Those relics would most likely be placed in these types of apsidal chapters. So the way that most of the Christian uh, churches are set up at this point is a central nave with a crossing aisle, the transept or transverse aisle. So quite often the main focus of activity is either here or in this rounded section of the apse. So an altar could be here or directly under the crossing. But that altar, if it's here, is not going to be interrupted by uh, pilgrims going around these side aisles into what is called the ambulatory, this area that goes behind the apse and into the next uh, side aisle that will allow you to visit these radiating chapels and venerate the relics in the reliquary in those spaces. So a bay is a new term for us in terms of the architecture of a uh, cathedral. The bay is simply the term for the space between two columns or piers. So this whole section here, this rectangular section, is one bay. So we often look at how the bays themselves are divided and whether the vaulting, the ceiling divisions, continue across from one bay in 
into the next or if they stay within one. In this case, you see four sections contained within one bay. The portal is the entrance of the chart. So you can think of the portal as the main entrance, which is always the west side. Always at least one main entrance, more often than not, it expands to three entrances, but for the most part, the portal can be thought of as the entirety of the door, the main entrance area. We subdivide the main portal into sections. The sides of the doors, the door jams, we often find sculptures there known as jam sculptures. The sculpture in the center is known as the trumeau. This is between two doors horizontal piece above the door is called the lintel, and then this lunette shape, or this half moon shape, half circular shape, formed above the lintel and beneath this uh, half uh, circular round arch, is known as the tympanum, and there will be sculpture there as well. We also want to make sure we're aware of the term cathedral. The cathedral is not only a Christian church, but it is the seat of a bishop, so it's a very important church within that community. One of the churches we want to know for the test, uh, Romanesque example from France, is saint Cernin. So saint Cernin was the first bishop of Toulouse. This church is in Toulouse, France. This church was a rebuild of a church that already existed there. So it is our best example of an early Romanesque design. It does have radiating chapels. There are None of the uh, buttresses, lying buttresses that you uh, associate with later churches. It's also very simple on the interior. You see within one bay, space between two columns, within one bay, we have one transverse arch here, this transverse vault. This barrel vaulting has ribbing at the piers or columns, but it's just essentially a barrel vault. There is no uh, dramatic design within there, and we have a very simple, what we call nave elevation. Your elevation is looking at the side wall from the nave, the central aisle, looking toward the side aisle. The section that divides the side aisle from the nave, of course, is called the nave arcade. That's these columns and arches. Above that, in this case, we have the tribune gallery. Now, that's essentially overflow seating. It's also a secondary space that people could physically sit or walk in, and you could lean through these openings and see what was going on down in the nave. So again, this kind of helps us accommodate more pilgrims. You notice that with saint Nin, we do have a fairly large round window on the uh, portal on the west end. That's your entrance side. The church is a Latin cross shape, meaning that the descending arm of the cross from the uh, entrance to the crossing aisle is our longest side. Arms of the cross left and right, and then of course the top head arm of the cross. These are shorter than this descending aisle. That makes it a Latin cross shape. We have in the center a pointed tower over that crossing. Another Romanesque design from France, this one from the Church of St. Lazarus or Saint Lazare in Autun in France. This uh, portal, main entrance here, front door, is a tympanum sculpture that is remarkable in its depiction of the fear that people must have had of the Last Judgment and being judged as a sinner and going to hell. You see Christ has returned in the second coming. He is not depicted realistically in space. Instead of foreshortening his thigh to make it look like he's sitting, we see the thigh angled outward, so it looks almost like he is doing kind of a plie, like a dance move. So we're not concerned here with accuracy in spatial depiction or in anatomy, but with readability of the symbols. On the left, you see angels uh, helping souls out of their graves, out of their tombs to face judgment, and the saved are being carried up to heaven. On the right, you see St. Michael paired off with a bunch of demons. The demons are cheating, and they're trying to get more souls by pulling on the weights, but you can see that they are weighing the souls, and the good souls are going to heaven. The bad souls are being cast into hell. It's a pretty dramatic uh, depiction there, for sure.
Our next Romanesque example is an initial uh, illumination. This initial R with a king fighting dragons is meant for us to kind of reference the idea of St. George and the dragon. It is from a tradition within the Christian church. Most of the uh, churches that we're looking at in France are essentially from the Benedictine order. They primarily, though, take their uh, philosophy from the monks at the Abbey Church at Cluny. And then the Cistercian monks, still Benedictine, but a little bit harsher in their approach to what a monk's life should be like, they were more restrained in their use of decorations within manuscripts. And so the Cistercian style sometimes will rely more on just the initial letter being uh, heavily illuminated and not so much the rest of the text. So at the beginning of each chapter, beginning word on a page, the first letter might be elaborate, but the rest not so much. Moving on into the Romanesque style in the Holy Roman Empire following the Ottonians, you can see that some of the tradition of church building that we saw with the Carolingian and Ottonian styles continues here at Spire Cathedral in Germany. Remember that as the Holy Roman Empire continues through time, the territory that it occupies less and less and less. France is now uh, independent from the Holy Roman Empire. The Holy Roman Empire during the Romanesque era is essentially primarily just Germany and a few territories to the uh, east. So what we're seeing here will look a little bit similar to what we see in France, but it does rely heavily on those initial ideas from the Carolingian. We have a very heavy, castle-like west portal. This facade on the west looks almost like a separate building in a way, almost like a castle unto itself. It, on the interior, is a very simple two-part elevation. In this case, no gallery, but we have the nave arcade followed by a clerestory, a set of windows. We see rounded arches here, so definitely Romanesque style, but if you look at the vaulting within a bay here, and in fact, if we look at our columns, we actually have a, uh, two bays covered by this new vaulting system. It's a groin vault. It's a barrel going one direction that has a barrel going the opposite direction at a 90 degree turn. So we actually have a four part crossing there or a quadripartite vault that actually covers two bays. You can see that we have alternating designs for these columns. We have engaged columns on this first pier. The next shows us a flattened column. The next is a rounded engaged column again, and that's where we see our ribbing just on the transverse vault, on the transverse arch there. So again, a simple two-part nave elevation, nave arcade and clerestory. We have a groin vault, uh, essentially dividing each of these sections into four parts. Those four parts cover two bays each. Uh, you can see that also on the diagram here. One column, next column, next column, but there's our divisions. The ribbing is just on the transverse, just straight across the nave. We have a dome in this case over our crossing section rather than an enormous tower. In the Holy Roman Empire, the tradition of manuscript illumination, of course, continues. This is a replica. Um, it probably was made under the supervision of, but was not drawn by Hildegard. Hildegard of Bingham was an important religious figure. She became abbess of her own abbey, and when she became abbess, she revealed that since childhood she had had these holy visions in which the word of God, the power of heaven, entered her body in flames into her, direct into, directly into her brain. And so when she received this first blast of information, she suddenly felt that she could uh, better describe, better explain the intricate meanings of all the works of the Gospels. And so she began to transcribe her visions. And in fact, what you see here is her having a vision and her monk, her scribe, working to record her words. So you actually see her power in this. 
turning our attention to Italy, at this point, the northern portion of Italy is under uh, some uh, direct contact with the uh, Holy Roman Empire. So there definitely were periods during which the Holy Roman Emperor had not only connections, of course, to the Pope, but had some territorial claims over northern uh, Italy. This is the um, most remarkable object we can look at, I think, from Romanesque architecture in Florence. It is the baptistry building. It is an octagonal plan. It is a freestanding separate building that sits in front of the Florence Cathedral. So the main entrance that you see here is directly opposite the west portal, the main entrance to the church. There are two more entrances on each side, on the north and on the south, and there are important sculptural uh, cast bronze doors on those entrances. For our purposes, though, we're looking at the architecture right now, uh, apart from the sculpture, Romanesque style, uh, definitely you can see that in the rounded arches and this very elaborately Eastern Byzantine-influenced mosaic that depicts the Last Judgment. Some other vocab terms to know for the test. The Tribune Gallery, that is your level of the nave elevation where we have that overflow seating or walking space for pilgrims to look down into the nave. That Tribune Gallery is primarily a Romanesque feature. It will continue a little bit into the early Gothic and it eventually will be uh, done away with. And most of the later Gothic churches will revert to a three part plan. In your nave elevation, though, if you have all four pieces, you would have the nave arcade separating the aisle from the nave, the level of the Tribune Gallery, then sometimes a blind arcade, which is just an series of arches that are not open for people to be inside of. It's a solid wall behind there. And so essentially what you're seeing is just a decorative element. We call that the triforium. It is essentially three columns across, so tri, three. And then above that area is the space for the windows or clerestory. So the ribbing would be the stonework that uh, is added to indicate the transitions from one section to another. It also helps to strengthen this support of the upper levels of the ceiling and the space above the ceiling. So the rib vaults can either go directly across, and that would be what we've seen so far, a transverse arch, or they can go crisscross from one uh, pier or column on a diagonal across to the next column on the opposite side. And so those are called diagonal, uh, diagonal vaults or diagonal ribs. The ribbing becomes more and more evident as we get to the Gothic styles. And Gothic styles more often than not are divided into six-part sections. We call this sexpartite or six-part vaulting. We sometimes see seven-part vaulting, and you'll see seven-part vaulting. Primarily, the best example in this unit is at Durham Cathedral in England. The triforium, again, is your blind arcaded gallery, that section above the uh, or directly below the clerestory usually, sometimes above the gallery itself. The webbing is the uh, stonework, the masonry in between the ribs. Here's Durham Cathedral, which is definitely our best example of a seven part vaulting system. So the vaulting essentially is gonna cover two bays, but there will be crisscross diagonal ribs from one column to the opposite next, and then from there to the opposite next. So it divides the two bays into seven sections in the vaulting. It's really pretty remarkable. It creates a lot of unity across those two bays. But this design is very much in the Romanesque style of England. You can see that there is some influence from the styles that are popular in the uh, territory in uh, Normandy in France. The northern coast of France or Normandy is of course going to be very important for us in England because the Duke of Normandy, William the Conqueror, will have actually 
in 1066 conquered England and become the English king. So the traditions of French architecture, specifically in the northern uh, Norman section, are going to infiltrate into England here. The English style of cathedrals, though, is very distinct. Even though it has a lot of influence from France, you'll see that the British cathedrals very often have this attached rectangular cloister space. And so that's very evident. You can usually tell the British cathedrals apart from other uh, cultures because instead of freestanding separate buildings, we have these attachments. In this design also, you can see the round arches. It's very much a Romanesque design. Round pillars, though, alternate with compound piers. These would be uh, piers that have multiple engaged columns. And it's the compound piers that seem to continue upward into the transverse ribbing. But the diagonal ribs go across in between those ones as well, dividing that again into a seven part vaulting system over two bays. Our nave elevation here is your nave arcade with the tribune gallery, which is a very Romanesque feature, and then a clerestory above that. We definitely can also recognize this from the large tower over the crossing. You can see that right here. There's the crossing aisle and the large tower. Um, also notice the very decorative uh, stonework here in these large pillars. Those are actually carved and painted, and they alternate in their designs. So we have three different main designs in those large, large columns. This particular uh, church is dedicated both to the Blessed Mary and to St. Cuthbert. Cuthbert was a monk who had worked and directed a monastery in Lindisfarne, and when the Vikings invaded, they actually carried his uh, bones to this spot. And it was uh, considered a miracle when they found the spot where the Durham Cathedral is. It's actually in the bend of a river, and so this territory was very easy to defend, and it was believed that that's where Cuthbert wanted to be, to be safe and to be revered. So we have, again, a connection to that Irish tradition or Hiberno tradition. Speaking of the Norman conquest, one of the most remarkable objects we can look at is the Bayou Tapestry. It was commissioned by the Bishop Odo, who is featured in the design. And he was not only, he also fought in the Battle of Hastings and he uh, proclaimed that this was the right act um, the right ruler, the righteous ruler of uh, England should be, in fact, William the Conqueror. He was uh, the Duke of Normandy. He believed that when the English king died without having produced an heir, he was under the impression that he, William, was meant to be the successor. But in fact, the king had named another earl, and so they went to war, and of course, William the Conqueror succeeded. And so this is the section of the Bayou Tapestry that shows the chaos of the Battle of Hastings. You can see that this is, in fact, embroidered. We call it a tapestry, but in fact, it's a pre-woven piece of linen that has the images stitched onto it. The work is done in two parts. The outlines are called stem stitches, and the part that fills color actually has stitching going in multiple directions. You have laid and couch work to fill all of this in. This is an enormous object. It is over 200 feet in length. In sections, it's divided vertically, sometimes by trees or other elements to divide scenes, but there's also a top and bottom register that separates the main action. There's also text included there as well. Here's an example of embroidery work being done. This is a stem stitch, and here's laid and couch work being uh, recreated to show you how those designs were filled in. Moving back to France and moving into the next era that we studied, the early Gothic. The early Gothic is notable for the use, instead of round arches, of pointed arches. And of course, that does allow us to build a little bit taller without having to spout the support beams further and further away from one another. So we can keep spaces narrow but achieve higher heights. This is a very notable early Gothic church. This was uh, 
a redesign commissioned by Abbot Suger. And Suger did not actually do the design, but he indicated what he wanted. So we can think of it as his idea. He was not actually trained as an architect. And his main concern was with the way that the radiating chapels could be opened up so that instead of separate walls between them as individual spaces, he devised this idea of this incredible use of ribbed vaulting, which with the use of point edges would allow us to create taller, high spaces, remove the stonework between the chapels and create this much more open, airy space that would facilitate these glorious stained glass windows. And you can see, in fact, that the stained glass starts to dominate very early in the Gothic style. And so it's actually bringing a lot more light into the churches. The Abbey Church of Saint-Denis is in Saint-Denis in France. It is the burial place of the French kings, historically. The church is pretty easy to recognize. It's a cross shape, Latin cross from above. There's no tower at the crossing. Uh, it is a semicircular space at the end. That ambulatory with the radiating chapels is the feature really to pay the most attention to. In the main body of the church, though, we have quadripartite or four-part vaults that go over one they each. The nave uh, elevation is three parts, nave arcade, no gallery, triforium, and then an enormous clerestory. So we're getting rid of that gallery for the most part. The early Gothic design here at Leon Cathedral is really one of the best examples, I think, that we can look at of that early Gothic style. It definitely has a four-part elevation, and this is one of the few churches that does have all four elements. There's a nave arcade, a tribune gallery, a triforium, and a clerestory. We will eventually drop the galleries overall, but we do have much more elaborate entrance here. The entrance portal is much recessed. The doors are very, very far recessed from the front facade of the church, an enormous rose window there, and two enormous towers to complete the west facade at the front of the the entrance area of the church. We have six part vaulting in this case, and that vaulting goes over two days. You can see that pretty clearly on the diagram here. If you look at one column to the next to the next, you can see that we have an X that is going across two bays that is dividing that space into actually six parts. There's a transverse rib here. So one, two, three, four, five, six sections, a six part or six part height division. And that division again goes over two bays. So you can see from this column to the next, to the one after it, that's two bays, but it comprises these six units, one, two, three, four, five, six in the vaulting. You can clearly see the four part elevation here, Nave Arcade, gallery, triforium, clerestory. It's the gallery section that will start to appear. This is a pretty tall interior. The height of this uh, nave is about 80 feet at its highest point. The next church to know for the test is somewhat of a transition from early Gothic to high Gothic. This is Chartres Cathedral in Chartres. It is properly known as Notre Dame du Chartres, or Our Lady of Chartres. It is the site that houses a very important relic, the tunic that Mary was believed to be wearing when she gave birth to Christ. So a piece of cloth, supposedly, literally from the birth of Jesus, is one of the relics of this church. And in fact, the original church holding that relic burned. And so the only part that remained was the west front. That's our early Gothic section. The rest of it had to be rebuilt, and miraculously they found the relic with the tunic unharmed. So it was believed that Mary wanted a more glorious church, and so the church was somewhat redone. So we actually have an early Gothic part, the west facade, the front, the portal, and the towers at the west. 
and then the entirety of the rest of the church is the redesign, is the high gothic. So you can see that there are some differences. When you look at the front of it, it does feel older than when you look at the interior. So you can really see those two time periods kind of colliding. We've got two big pointed towers at the west facade. We definitely have ribbed vaults. We have pointed arches. Obviously, it's very gothic. It is a quadripartite system, and that four-part vaulting covers one bay each. So it does have more divisions along the length of the uh, nave itself. You can see a three-part elevation. There's a nave arcade, a triforium, and a clerestory. But the clerestory itself is um, very much the dominant feature here. You're going to see these two lancet windows with an oculus round window above it. That's all considered one unit. All of that glasswork is the clerestory there. Uh, so again, this church was primarily rebuilt after a fire, so in two halves. The west uh, facade is our early part, the rest is our high gothic part. You can clearly see on the high gothic end flying buttresses all around the apse and even along the nave as well. We've already talked about the uh, alternating use of either solid or what we can call compound piers, a column or a pier that has multiple engaged columns attached to it. The next idea we're really looking at, though, as we move into the Gothic, is this flying buttress. So we can refer to as a vertical buttress. I usually refer to these as a pier on the outside. The upper section, the decorative bit, is known as a pinnacle. And the flying buttress is the rib that goes across. It's this masonry work that helps to support the building. So increasingly, as we make the buildings taller and taller, one of the best features of a pointed arch is that it does allow allow the architect to build a higher uh, for the roof, for the ceiling, but it also distributes weight in a different way. A round arch tends to press outward and need a lot of thick support in the walls. The pointed arch does not have that problem, but it can sometimes be somewhat unstable, um, not so much because of its downward thrust, but because of its, so it's supported by this almost exoskeleton of flying buttresses and piers on the outside of the church. But that means then that the walls don't have to be so massively thick and solid stone. We can put more and more and more windows, and you're going to see that as we go forward. So the windows themselves, again, the ones that are tall, um, that are rectangular with a pointed top are our lancet windows. The glass itself is comprised of individual separate pieces that are held in place by our stained glass leading, literal pieces of thin lead that are uh, holding those sections of glass in place. When we get to England, we'll see that the vaulting becomes even more elaborate as we get into the Gothic, and the British churches will have this beautiful spiderweb appearance. We call this fan vaulting. It looks sort of like the rib of a lady's fan. And then that element here, you can see it here and here, these descending decorative elements are known as pendants. They hang downward. Our next high Gothic example is Notre Dame de Paris. This is Our Lady of Paris. It is on an island in the river in the middle of the city. And so this is a very important site. Not only was this church, is this church still standing there, but this was also at one time the pal uh, site of the Palace of Ing. So just on the other end of this small island, we would have had the palace and also chapels attached there. So very, very important. It's meant to be considered the heart, literally, of Paris, the center of that city. And this church is essentially entirely high Gothic, but it was built over an enormous span of time, really. It was begun in about 1163. Most of the choir and the transept would by within about 20 years. The flying buttresses, though, and the exterior of the church was not really completed until about the year 1200. There was extensive remodeling around 1225, and the facade itself was not completed until about 1260. So I'm giving you an average year within there of the year 1200 of its primary 
nearly being done during that high gothic when you look down at the view of the church from above it clearly is a latin cross as opposed to a greek cross where all four arms would be the same length you can see that we have two towers at the west facade and a very tall very narrow pointed tower at the crossing where the transept crosses the nave so that's a really easy uh, element to remember this feature of that pointed tower in the center right at the crossing will help you recognize this church also remember that the towers on the west facade are blunt at the top they do not come to a point we do have rose windows both on the west portal but also on the transept arms and you can see we have a lot of flying buttresses all along the apse and they've we also have six partite, six part nave vaulting that covers two bays each. So it does expand or widen the space that the vaulting seems to cover because it's covering two bays at a time. So it unifies that ceiling and actually makes it a few separate divided sections. The two parts, though, or the two bays rather, are divided into six parts by the uh, diagonal ribbing that occurs there as well as at either end the transverse straight across rib. The uh, original elevation, the original design in the early phase was evident around the crossing. You could see that we had a nave arcade followed then by a tribune gallery, then an oculus and then a small window. So really this is all the clerestory, but divided into two very separated pieces. There's only a little bit of this still evident around the area where the nave is crossed by the transept. The majority of the interior is divided thus. You can see that here, nave arcade, tribune gallery, clerestory above. And that clerestory is now two lancets with a circular window, all kind of as one unified unit. So this is the high Gothic element, three-part elevation there, Notre Dame de Paris. This is much, much higher church. It's now 115 feet in height at the height of the nave. Getting just a little bit higher than that, this is now 144 feet at the nave highest point. This is the Church of Amiens. This is Amiens Cathedral in Amiens, France. The architects are Robert de Luches, Thomas de Cormont, and Renaud de Cormont. We have two towers at the west facade. They're essentially uh, fairly blunt, although they do have some decorative crenellation on them. We definitely see here a very, very elaborate portal. One of the most remarkable aspects of which, of course, is this deep recession, and then these extraordinarily large sculptures. This is known as the King's Gallery. Usually the King's Gallery is directly beneath the rose window, but you can see the statues here are relatively large. We also have pretty large flying buttresses along the nave area. You can see clearly ribbed vaults, pointed arches. We are looking here at quadripartite vaulting over one bay at a time. But this is definitely one of the high Gothic style. You can see that there's more use of decorative uh, sculpture. The architecture itself is becoming even more elaborate, taller, and more pointed in every poem. The Rayan style is evident here, again, on the island within uh, which we also have uh, the Church of Notre Dame de Paris. We also have this tiny chapel, which was at one point part of the king's castle. And so here's sort of a reconstruction. There is Saint Chapelle. So you can imagine this is a place that the king would go personally for uh, religious uh, services. The building itself is meant as the repository of the relic of the crown of thorns and other relics from the uh, crucifixion and resurrection and so the church itself is pretty remarkable it has this odd double porch or double portico and then an enormous rose window notice we don't have flying buttresses here but we do have very strong vertical buttressing that divides the building 
into an enormous space for windows. These glass, stained glass windows, lancets with oculus at the top, those lancet windows are almost 50 feet height in this remarkable church. We call it Rayonet style because of this incredible beauty of this stained glass that it just sort of radiates. Um, we definitely here are looking at four-part vaulting, quadripartite vaults, pointed arches, and clearly a use of ribbed vaults as well. The next really dramatic uh, church to look at comes from, again, the end of Gothic era. We can call this late Gothic flamboyant style. The flamboyant style gets its name from how over the top it is. It has more architecture and sculptural decoration than we've seen anywhere else. It almost looks like it was a fantasy rather than something made by human beings. This is the Church of Saint Macau. It's in Rouen in France. There is a very elaborate pointed tower at the crossing, but let's take a look at the crossing. Transept aisle is, notice that the transept doesn't extend very far from the side aisles. So it is still a Latin cross format, but those arms don't extend much beyond the architecture of the side aisles. So it does form somewhat more of a rectangular format. We definitely have a very rounded end where the uh, radiating chapels are, but that is echoed by the roundness on the front of the cathedral, on the entrance side. We do have three real doors, and then we have false entrances with architectural detailing on either side. There appear to be five entrances, and instead of a flat facade, a curved facade. This incredible amount of carved and perforated tracery almost obscures the rose window from the street side, but the light that comes into it from within is really pretty beautiful. Um, we have here a full three-part elevation, a nave arcade, a triforium, clerestory, no gallery in this case. Case. We also looked at the work of Viard de Encore. He is a mason who actually did record several of his projects and ideas in personal notebooks or sketchbooks. And you can see him here applying ideas of geometry to the human face and to animal faces and bodies, trying to find some harmony in uh, symmetry and geometry and mathematical proportion. It is, of course, not perfect proportion, but he's getting fairly close. We also looked at some illumination by Master Onoa. This is the uh, David page, the folio 7 verso side of a breviary of Philip LaBelle. So the breviary, again, has brief uh, passages that are meant for individual meditation, individual prayer. And this particular page shows stories from the life of David. So you see the main section here. There is David facing off against the giant Goliath, who's already grabbing his head. And there's uh, Goliath with the wound in his head. And here's David about to decapitate the corpse of the giant. But the thing that's so remarkable about this, not only does it tell two parts of the story within one image, but look at the highlight and shadow, the uh, almost chiaroscuro effect that's happening specifically on David's body. You really start to get the feeling that we're leaning into what will be the Renaissance. And here we are in the year roughly 1300 when this piece is completed. Looking over at England, the English Gothic example is another cathedral complex with attached cloister, but not to be confused with Durham Cathedral, this is Salisbury Cathedral. It has pointed arches, and it continues the obsession the British have with lots of decoration on the insides of these churches, at least in terms of color. But we can see here that we have a three-part elevation, nave, arcade, triforium, clerestory. We've got a quadripartite, four-part vaulting, pointed arches with ribs, and definitely an interesting feature here is this double transept, double crossing aisle, which we don't have in any of the other uh, examples we've looked at up to this point. Uh, Church of Westminster, Westminster Abbey, the specific part I want us to be aware of is actually an addition. So here's the main part of the cathedral with a transept, we see the attached cloister, very British, but we also see here this extension, and that's the part we're looking at now. This is known as the Chapel of Henry VII, and it is our best example of this incredible fan vaulting and the descending pendants. So you can definitely recognize Westminster by its two towers at the west, 
the portals, the most elaborate ones, are actually on the transepts as opposed to the west entrance end. We have the added chapel of Henry VII, which has this incredible fan vaulting. But in the main body of the church, you'd have quadripartite vaulting and obvious pointed arches in the Gothic style. The Holy Roman Empire, of course, does continue. And so here we are essentially in what is now modern day Germany. This is a reliquary from roughly 1190 headed into the 1200s. It is a reliquary for the three kings and would have housed the crowns worn by the three kings who were uh, part of the story of the nativity of Christ. Peter Parler and the Parler family, well-known architects in the Holy Roman Empire, specifically in Germany, and their work definitely had an influence on the architecture of the 1300s. This is the Church of the Holy Cross, and it is what we call a hall church, meaning that the side aisles are almost exactly the same height as the nave, but the most uh, incredible feature, the vaulting in this case is a really intricate division. It is essentially in each bay divided into 18 subsections. So it's a really remarkable series of uh, ribs and faults to create this decorative effect here in Germany. Looking now at Italy, as we move into the 1200s, 5th century, 1200s, we could be just as easily calling this either late medieval or proto-Renaissance, the beginnings of the pre-Renaissance. This is the work of Nicola Pisano. Uh, Nicola Pisano and his son Giovanni both were sculptors. This is Nicola's design and uh, carving for the pulpit of the baptistry in Pisa. So that's what their last name actually means, is that they're from the carving includes some really uh, elaborate figures and there are uh, figures here that d relate to uh, the nativity to the birth of jesus you can see they also relate to the crucifixion so these carvings really look a lot like the sarcophagi carvings that we saw in uh the Roman Empire, for sure, uh, during the Crit era, but now being used to create literally um, a stage for the priest to uh, profess from. And you can see the eagle is where the lectern is, where the Bible would have been placed. There's also references to classical mythology. These figures of the virtues that are placed here include one figure that is very clearly meant to reference Hercules. So again, you'll see the Italians kind of fusing their own pagan mythological uh, history and the artwork of the pagan era of the Roman Empire into this new Christian era of the Middle Ages. We want to know the work of Cimabue. He's an important painter from the late 1200s toward the beginning of the 1300s in Italy. Cimabue's work to know for the test is an altarpiece. It's deceptive on the screen. It's an enormous piece, well in excess of 12 feet tall. It is the Madonna enthroned with angels and prophets, and it clearly references that Eastern Byzantine style. You can see the gold in the background clearly, but also the kind of repetitive faces of the angels. We also have this slightly odd architectural perspective issue happening. The uh, figures of these uh, prophets at the bottom seem to be in buildings or spaces that have rounded arches over them, but those round arches that now transition into the steps of the Virgin's throne. So clearly not a realistic depiction here. In the study of the Proto-Renaissance, we definitely looked at the use of tempera paint. A lot of the paintings that we saw in the scriptoria, the illuminated manuscripts, many of those are tempera paint as well. Tempera paint is essentially pigment suspended in a food product. In this case, egg tempera is the most common. It is literally the liquid part from the inside of the egg yolk. It dries hard and clear and it helps to stick the pigment to the surface you're painting on. The term Renaissance itself is the term we use for the rebirth of interest in the philosophy and art and culture of the classical world, Greece and Rome. Within the Renaissance itself, we see the rise of a philosophy known as humanism, which is about the perfection or the rather perfectibility of human beings. Not that we are perfect, that 
but that we can become better through work, through classical education, and through a desire to serve our community and to better ourselves. Moving from tempera to fresco painting, the Italians perfect the idea of true fresco or buon fresco painting on still damp plaster so that the pigment absorbs into the plaster and becomes a permanent part of the wall. So an artist only apply as much plaster as they believe they could paint within a single day. We call that one day's work or a ginorata. In the Renaissance, artists did not make work and then just put it up for sale. The system really was such that a patron, the person paying, would seek out an artist, go to their workshop, look at the examples they had in their workshop, and then offer a commission, a contracted project. So the patron would tell the artist what they wanted uh, them to make. There are a lot of themes and even compositions that are repeated quite frequently by multiple artists throughout the Renaissance because they were making what they were required to make to make money. Training was different too. Artists didn't go to art school. They trained in an apprenticeship system. So you would go and live in the household, work in the workshop of the master artist and do the grunt work like the cleaning of brushes, the making of brush brushes, grinding pigment, mixing paints, uh, and you would learn their uh, techniques and their skills. Then once you had completed your apprenticeship, you could become a master painter yourself if you could gain uh, admission into the painter's guild. Now a guild is kind of like a union and kind of like a body that governs um, the rules of any given business. There were guilds for each different profession. There's a uh, weaver's guild, a baker's guild, a painter's guild. The members of the guild would vote on who could be admitted into the membership, but they also could help control things like the pricing structure and the way that business was conducted. So they're an oversight. They're a, a group that oversees uh, how business is conducted, but also protects members and make sure that they're being paid appropriately, etc. So that's part of the economic system of the Renaissance. Uh, the quatrefoil is the last vocab term for us on that slide. And the quatrefoil you see at the bottom of the screen here, the basic idea is that it is four lobes, quatra four, so four elements. And it can be divided in different uh, orientations, but this is a common formatting or framing device in late Middle Ages, especially in Italy. Turning now to the 1300s, 14th century, 1300s, we're looking at the artist Giotto. And Giotto is probably our first true uh, proto-Renaissance artist because he really changes from that style of the Eastern Byzantine into something that still has that gold background. But notice the highlight and shadow, the chiaroscuro across the body really looks like there's a three-dimensional form underneath robes. This is another altarpiece. Very similar to the Chamava way we saw. So you can see how the artists are sort of recycling the same idea because that's what they're being asked to make by their clients. But in this case, you can see that Jotho's sense of perspective is far more accurate and his sense of the body underneath the clothing, again, far more accurate. You certainly see that here in his remarkable uh, sort of masterpiece of his career, uh, the Arena Chapel. And this was completed by Jotho with several assistants. It took over 600 separate working sessions, 600 plus generata have been identified making up this entire uh, fresco cycle. It is one of the most remarkable uh, biblical depictions. It includes this scene though that I think is really important for us because it really starts to show art not being subjects of uh, saints looking out of the painting at us, but it acts as though we're looking through a window into a three-dimensional space. We see figures from behind, from the back, three-quarter views, profiles. You see highlight and shadow transitioning in gradients over their bodies. You can see foreshortening and the angels coming forward. The lamentation, of course, is mourning the body of Christ after the crucifixion and before the entombment. We then looked at uh, work from Siena. This is the work of Duccio. Duccio's painting, when it was completed, was paraded to the 
cathedral in Siena, and it shut the entire city down. They had a wide parade and festival to celebrate this new work. And you can see that Duccio also, like Giotto, has a uh, believable chiaroscuro. There's still the hierarchical scale. The figures who are more important are larger than the others. And a bit of repetition in the angelic faces, but you can see these subdivided panels really allow for Duccio to show multiple scenes, multiple stories with believable perspective in them. Simone Martini and his assistant Lippo Memi created the Annunciate altarpiece, a very gothic frame and a deep gold background that sort of feels like it's from that Byzantine tradition, but if you look at the way the figures are handled, the naturalism and the pose, especially Mary's kind of recoiling in fear from this angelic, unexpected presence that's telling her that she will have the baby that is the Christ child is sort of a shocking amount of emotion and believable three-dimensional form. Pietro Lorenzetti also continues this believable architectural linear perspective and believable form in his altarpiece painting also for the Siena Cathedral. This is the birth of the Virgin. So you see the Virgin's mother and her husband awaiting the news. They have halos, as does Virgin Mary here, who's being bathed immediately after the birth. But if you look at the ceiling, you can really see this is the frame of the painting. This is ribbing and vaulting that creates a groin vault, four-part quadripartite vault over the space of this room. So it really is believable three-dimensional perspective and believable three-dimensional human figures. Ambrosio Lorenzetti, brother, is uh, the author of this remarkable fresco, and this is just a portion of what decorates this entire room. The Sala della Pace, the room of peace in the uh, Publico, or the City Hall in Siena, and it's meant sort of as an announcement of the good works of the Sienese government. So this painting is known as the effects of good government in the city, and in the country. And so this section actually continues right from this side here where the gate is. You can see the end of the gate out into the country. And right over the gate is an angel who's carrying a gallows and a sign that tells you to follow the law when you're in Siena or you will face judgment, the gallows. Uh, but within the, everything is happy. We see people and horses. We see people going about their business. We see people in shops, people going about their daily lives in a fairly believable perspective. It's not perfect, but pretty close. And this painting is paired with um, another set of frescoes or another set of images, rather, in fresco in the same room, which show the effects of bad government. And it shows the city falling apart and people dying in the streets, and the governor even looks as though he's the devil. He has horns. The last major work that we need to know uh, sculpturally is the work of Andrea Pisano. Again, his name just means that he's from Pisa, working here in Florence, in Italy. And Andrea Pisano is the author of these remarkable cast bronze doors. So again, here's our quatrefoil format, dividing each of these scenes, framing these scenes. And they tell a variety of different biblical tales, but especially important is the birth of John the Baptist and the baptism of Christ sequence that happens in through right around this area. The uh, baptismal sequence is probably the most important for us because these are the doors to the Florence Baptistry. They are the original east doors. They faced the original uh, the east doors rather faced the uh, western entrance to the cathedral itself, but these doors were moved. After the, these doors were installed, there was a competition held to create new doors for the cathedral, and the winner of that competition, Ghiberti, created a set of doors also in quatrefoil frames. So these doors were moved to the south entrance, uh, Ghiberti's doors went on the north, and Ghiberti was given a second commission for brand new doors, a second set from him, third set overall, for the east doors, and those were known as the Gates of Paradise. They were uh, named that because Michelangelo himself said that they were fit to be the doors to heaven. So this is the original, though. These are the doors that set all of that Renaissance action in motion. So without Pisano, we would not have had that competition for even better doors later. 
The last painting to know is a fresco cycle that comes to us also from Pisa. This is the Campo Santo. It is a rather unique uh, cemetery. Most of the burials are under the floor and in the walls in this architectural space near the uh, cathedral, so it completes the buildings around the Pisa Cathedral that includes all Sapestry and a Campanile or bell tower. And obviously, these images reference the plague, so you can see the triumph of death is the main painting to know from that cycle. 